The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley. With me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a traditional Catholic priest. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Doing well, Father. Great to, great to be back again for another week. Yeah, it's good to see you. Yeah, there's um, still a lot Especially going on. Especially this week, Thanksgiving. Week, Thanksgiving right? week. That's right, oh, Father. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there, there's still a lot going on with the, uh, the the elections here, Father, in the United States. Um, it seems not a, not a day goes by where there's some kind of striking development um, that, that we read about in the news. There's a lot of information, a lot of misinformation, obviously, with the media going around. Um, people are still looking for a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of leadership and, and wondering uh, how we should view all of this through a through a Catholic lens, Father. So, I guess where where do we stand with uh, with the current state of the election, and, and what kind of comments could you make on some of the recent developments that we've seen occur? Well, seeing it through a Catholic lens. It's not a bad way to put it, because we use lenses to correct poor vision. And we use lenses to make sharp and clear things that otherwise are rather cloudy and obscure, right? Yeah. And uh, out of focus. So seeing it through a Catholic lens brings it into focus and shows us what it really is. And uh, there's a colossal battle going on right now. Um, it's not just a matter of you know, but what the press would like to, uh, the media, the mainstream media would present it as a, some kind of a title fight between, you know, t Biden in the white trunks and Trump in the black <laughs> trunks or whatever. It, it's a battle for civilization. I mean, the whole book, any vestiges of Christian civilization are at stake here. Yeah. And, um, uh, I mean, we could go and go at some length and explain what what that means, but I think everybody who watches this show knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, even looking at the people uh, uh, Joe Biden is naming for his cabinet, and uh, I mean, you, you get a good idea. We're talking about revolutionary, yeah, uh, revolutionary things. So uh, the the uh, conflict is one of uh, just a foundational conflict about what our country, entire country, is about. Uh, the principles, uh, you know, involving our whole way of life as a republic are at stake here. Uh, but, um, you know, there are those who suggest that uh, President Trump should uh, concede uh, or at least compromise. But as he's saying, you know, we're dealing with, well, what he's actually called a criminal conspiracy, right? And so how can one compromise or concede to that? It, it's a matter of conscience that you... You can't concede or compromise to that, especially when they want to take over your country, right? Uh, so, um, now just recently, actually, he did give the go-ahead to the GSA. I think it's the General Services uh, Agency or Administration or something, under the leadership of a, of a lady. Uh, and she actually does speak as, as a real lady, but she's very strong also. She says... <clears throat> that uh, President Trump had to authorize her to start the process of the transition to a potential Biden presidency. And only President Trump could give her that authorization. And so she has steadfastly refused to be pressured into beginning the process without the authorization from the president, which is only the right thing to do. It's the legal thing to do. But she says that she has been subjected to literally thousands of threats, that she has been threatened, that her children have been threatened, her husband has been threatened. She said even her pets have been threatened <laughs> wow. by phone calls, by emails, by letters. She said she's been getting, well, the report is actually thousands of threats to get going and arrange for this, trans, uh, this transition for a Biden presidency. And, but she simply said, well, I, I could not do this legally and morally and eth ethically until I had the authorization of the president. 
And so Trump gave her that authorization. <clears throat> Perhaps he gave her the authorization, that's because he wants to concede <clears throat> to a Biden presidency, um, which he would consider to be, well, evidently illegitimate. I mean, if his claims are true, and he, he's convinced they are true. But maybe for her own sake, out of consideration for her peace, uh, he gave her the authorization. So she has actually started the process. <clears throat> but President Trump has said very clearly, he, this is not a concession. <clears throat> he said it just seems like the, rest, the best thing to do for the country at the moment, you know, to at least let this process go forward, because he's not conceding anything. And there are those who are actually saying now, and there are, those, there are some voices who actually are deep within the, even the intelligence community, who are saying <clears throat> that this entire operation was a sting operation set up by... President Trump, did you hear that? Yes, sir. <clears throat> that he set up the entire operation because he knew exactly what they would do and that they were going to try to steal the election. <clears throat> and he was prepared. He was prepared to monitor everything, come up with all the evidence necessary to prove that that's exactly what they were doing. And um, if that's the case, I think there is some credibility to that claim. I think there's some credibility to that claim, not only because it's being made now, but because of things I'd heard even months ago uh, from people I know who actually have contacts, uh, that there was something, something afoot, something afoot to actually bring to life, bring to light the enormity of the electoral uh, process cheating, the cheating involved in the electoral process. And because Skittle and Dominion and all of these, all of these um, companies, basically, that, that provide this, this software, uh, the election software, have actually been involved in so many different elections that have looked so shady for so long. And possibly President Trump has been on the pipeline of information that made him think, then we've got to take them down. We've got to expose them and take them down. And maybe he was just the one to do it. Uh, he's not one to back down. As he himself said, you, you, you know, you'd be unwise to vote against me, to, to bet against me. And so here he is, okay, in the midst of this intense conflict. And he's out golfing, right? right. He's golfing. And people probably wonder, what's he doing? Is he like Nero fiddling while Rome is burning or what? <laughs> But then you, you think, well, wait a minute, it's not like him in the middle of a, an intense um, battle like this with so much at stake to simply, you know, go out golfing as though he hadn't a care in the world. Well, the fact is, may, maybe, maybe this is uh, what might make his constituents rather nervous, that he doesn't appear to be taking it as seriously as they are. Uh, maybe he's taken it very seriously for so long now. He's made provisions for it, and he, he knows what he's doing, and that the situation is under control. I mean, what we see is the news coming out day by day by day, you know, uh, uh, this court has denied that, and this court has thrown out that <coughs> suit by the Trump administration and so on. Um, and it looks as though he's losing in all counts, and these states, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, have, have certified the vote, Right. You know, in Michigan, uh, there were those uh, two, two souls who contested the vote, would not certify, but they said it was because they were being threatened. Their families were being threatened. Again, we're talking about um, gangsters, basically. We're talking about, yeah, about thugs, know. right? And this is what they do. Uh, but uh, I guess that would go along with what President Trump said in terms of a criminal enterprise here. So... Um, it seems the, the news that has come out here with the, the, the mainstream media uh, reporting all of the bad news for the Trump administration and how Biden is now you know, riding this great wave and, and uh, the world is congratulating him right now, uh, that those who supported him and still support him might be very dismayed by this. He has not Better than I, though. He hasn't flinched one bit about this. And so I, I would think that 
the reports that he was prepared for this, and he has the, the, uh, he has the evidence. I, I believe he has the evidence. The question now is, uh, when he presents the evidence where it needs to be, not in the media, um, but before the judges, maybe of the Supreme Court, uh, what will they do? <clears throat> we know that there will be an intense pressure and threats brought against them. But there are members of the Supreme Court. They've got to be prepared for that type of thing. You know, they have to have the integrity necessary, at least the majority of them do, <clears throat> to be able to stand that because they're supposed to have a great devotion to the country and they'll live up to their, to their oath. Yeah. You know? But also, um, you know, they might throw the election uh, back to the, the states and the uh, legislatures of the states. <clears throat> and if, if the uh, election goes back to the, the states, the legislatures, choosing electors for the Electoral College, which is supposed to meet on December 14th, <clears throat> and choose the true president of the United States of America. There are a lot of things that happen to happen, have to happen very quickly here, right? But in that case, it is very, very conceivable, even likely, that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, President Trump will be uh, declared the, the actual bona fide winner of this election, and he will go on to be president. I was just reading where the, the editor at large of Australia's uh, Sky News Australia is predicting that Trump is going to win this. He says he's, he's very close to a miracle win. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there are others who are actually now uh, coming to grips with the reality of it. Mm. And they're coming out of that, that stupor that the modern media imposes on everybody. Yeah. In their minds. Yeah. They're beginning to realize is there a lot, there's a lot more at stake here mm -hmm. than um, the media would allow you to think. And that uh, when the Trump attorneys say there are people who are going to go to jail for criminal activity over this, mm -hmm. that uh, they, they know what they're talking about. Father, if this does actually turn out the way that we're hoping and, and praying for and um, you know if if this miracle win were to be pulled off can can we even imagine the uh, the reaction that we would see uh, from from the leftists and and, and from, uh, from from that entire crowd I mean how, how would we how can we prepare for something like that how would we respond to that well be in the state of grace is the first way to prepare for any emergency <laughs> be in the state of grace with God obviously but you know there, there's going to be uh, a lot of trouble. It'll get rather violent. We know who these people are. We see what they've done, what they're capable of doing, what they pledge to do yeah. in the future. They're even talking about civil war, yes. right? Um, yeah. So we had to repair as we would for any emergency. Okay, I mean, as far as food, clothing, shelter, and and defense, and so on. But um, in the end, um, I mean, th there's only so much you can do. Do what you can, according to the resources you have. Yeah. Uh, but you have to trust God. And if you do the right thing, then God is going to take care of you. So uh, other than food, clothing, shelter, defense, and so on and so forth, I mean, prayer and penance, and, and uh, as I say, just receiving the sacraments and being in the state of grace, that's the, <clears throat> that is the indispensable thing, you know, as far as preparation goes. For those who have a family, like yourself, with little children, obviously you want to make sure they're, they're prepared <clears throat> they're prepared and things are prepared for them, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> maybe, um, you know, as they say, a shelter of some kind would be good. But, you know, um, our, our last program was called um, uh, something the, the, the Head of the Snake is Exposed, yes. right? Yes. A very uh, pithy title, um, which is not my doing or your doing, but the work of a very <laughs> incisive individual. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I think that said it very well. Um, you know, a snake will will defend itself, right? If it feel in a, in a, like a rattler, it'll rattle and it'll draw back and be ready to strike. But this is not a rattler. This is much more deadly than that. This is like an asp. <clears throat> um, and uh, they don't warn you, but they'll squirm and they'll fight, and um, they will uh, even after you cut their head off. You know, like the head is exposed. And the reason why that title was chosen, I think I made that comment, but I was referring to the Blessed Mother. Right. 
you know, and the crushing of the head of the snake. Now, now the head of the snake is exposed now. And um, it is very possible that now it is exposed because it, it's going to be feeling the weight of the heel. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but you know how the snake thrashes when you do that, right? So we expect the snake to thrash. <clears throat> yeah. So we can't be surprised. Just as I mentioned earlier, we, we can't be surprised about the selection. We, should have ex we must yes. have expected the selection to go yes. this way. <clears throat> and we must have expected that there would be this challenge even unto death, the necessity of refusing to accept and let it pass. <clears throat> now, the next thing we have to expect is the left's reaction. Yeah. If they're caught red-handed yeah. in this criminal activity, and it's going to um, um, make some of them very uncomfortable, right? Expose yeah. them for who they are. We expect that the snake is going to, the serpent is going to thrash. <laughs> and we have to be ready for that yep. thrashing. Well, Father, something else that we wanted to get into, we've kind of hinted at on a couple of programs, and I thought maybe we could at least touch on it today. By the way, if I might, yeah. just, might just say, you know, we have rosaries being prayed. We're, December 6th, uh, the Feast of St. Nicholas here in Cincinnati. We're going to uh, hopefully be uh, right outside the Hamilton County Courthouse, yep. uh, as we were November 1st, mm -hmm. with about, I guess, 200 people or so out there in the, in the, in the blowing wind. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully we'll have twice as many or three times as many. Uh, and we're not praying on the courthouse steps for the sake of worshiping the courthouse. <laughs> we have the, the magnificent processional cross from the Council of Baltimore uh, that dedicated our country to the Immaculate Conception yeah. of the Blessed Mother. We have that magnificent processional cross given by the bishops to the Archbishop of Baltimore on that occasion. And we have a statue of Our Lady uh, with, you know, the, the representation of her Immaculate Conception. The banner, Catholic Man for Christ the King. And so uh, it, it is before the, those that we kneel, before the crucifix, we turn to our Lord there at the front door of the courthouse. We kneel down and we pray with our attention directed to him. We pray the 15 decades of the rosary. I would invite anyone and everyone to come and join us. But if you can't, because you live too far away, then organize rosary, uh, public rosaries of your own, wherever you are. You've got to do this. How to do this. This is December 6th we're planning. Now, that's about a week before the Electoral College meets, or should. It's scheduled to meet. <clears throat> um, so, prime time to be praying, because they're the ones ultimately have to make the decision. Right? Um, it has to be done by Electoral College. And uh, I would recommend that every, every, you know, everyone appeal to heaven through uh, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Mm -hmm. for deliverance uh, from all evils, and uh, particularly to deal with this mm -hmm. issue of uh, praying for our country. We owe it to God. We owe it to who has blessed this country so, so wonderfully mm -hmm. as we commemorate with Thanksgiving. <laughs> and so perfect opportunity right now, as I say, to be thankful to God and show it, praying the rosary, asking for God's continued blessings. And I think you mentioned as well, Father, that uh, that December 6th through the 14th, when the Electoral College meets, that's a, a span of, of nine days. That's actually a span of nine days. Be a good, yeah. good time for a novena. Perfect novena, beginning yeah. December 6th and ending on December 14th. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Well, Father, this other topic, uh, the, the Great Reset, which <laughs> we've seen in the news a lot lately, mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems the, uh, the, the left, they uh, seem to believe they have everything going their way, especially with the, uh, with the elections here in the United States. And um, it seems they, they've definitely been emboldened, like we've been talking about. And there's, there's been a lot made about this, uh, this so-called Great Reset, um, which is an initiative uh, from the, the World Economic Forum, as you've mentioned before on the program. But I'd like to, to kind of just get your take on some of this, Father, just because it, it seems, um, you know, every other day now there's some new new uh, political leader somewhere across the world coming out in support of this, this Great Reset and how we need this Great Reset. I saw um, uh, the uh, in Canada, it was uh, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau came out in support of this. I saw uh, John Kerry just recently here in the United States came out in support of this Great Reset. And uh, so I thought I'd just read straight from their uh, website here, theworldeconomicforum.org. 
uh, says there is an urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. To improve the state of the world, the World Economic Forum is starting the Great Reset Initiative. And it talks a lot, Father, about this COVID-19 crisis and how this, uh, this, this crisis has just given us the perfect opportunity to have this Great Reset of the entire world. Every system we have, every financial system, every uh, economic system, um, everything, health, energy, education, every system, the entire world needs to be reset. Everything needs to be rethought. Everything needs to be re redone, remade. Mm -hmm. um, and now is the perfect time to do it because of this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, what, what's your reaction to that, Father? Do you do you agree with this? Is this a good time to kind of reset the whole world? It's a good time for them. The great reset. They, they've got everyone uh, terrified, or not everyone, but they've got yeah. much of the world terrified. And the politicians are using this, even even when medical uh, officials, experts, you know, yeah. are saying this pandemic is over. If it ever was a pandemic, yeah. it's over now. I mean, even the former vice president of Pfizer now has yes. come out, Michael Eden. And he, he a Brit, Brit, a British gentleman, a scientist, um, he was in charge of developing medications for respiratory illnesses uh, for 30 years with Pfizer, I think, in that, in that capacity. Yep. This man knows exactly what he's talking about. And he's, he's come out and said, made it very, very clear that this pandemic is over. The politicians are using it. They're trying to drive a vaccine. We don't need a vaccine. No vaccine is necessary right now. <clears throat> and uh, he made some strong points. He said, this smells of evil. That's what he said. He said, this smells of evil. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think uh, he produced a, a video. Uh, I think it's been removed from YouTube, you know, because everybody has to be silenced, you know, who, who doesn't uh, support the, uh, the, the, the storyline, the narrative of the revolutionaries, the leftists. But uh, you have some very, very... Um, competent and, and, and uh, yeah, well-credentialed uh, gentlemen like this who are, who are telling us, in all honesty, this is, this is a sham. It's a fraud. Um, this isn't to say that uh, there isn't a virus. It is, doesn't say that people doesn't die, don't die from it. But the politicians are making so much of it, they're using it and abusing it to bully populations into this, well, great reset, actually. And um, now, you know, uh, Joe Biden's talking about locking down the country again. Just when the, of all the people, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control of the United States, and who, the World Health Organization, are saying lockdowns are bad for you. You know, they do more damage than, than good. They do not stop the virus, and they, they actually kill people. Uh, so, um, uh, but Joe Biden, you know, is talking about locking down the country again. Well, the story is that they know that this economy cannot stand another lockdown. And their, their purpose is to, to so cripple the economies of the world that uh, they, people will look now to this Great Reset as a great deliverance. And they're marketing this. They're marketing this idea of the Great Reset as a, as a new form of capitalism. Mm -hmm. There's been such a vehement reaction against socialism, uh, thank goodness, despite the, the generations that have been trained in socialism in the public school systems and so on, uh, in this country and elsewhere, there's, been, there's still such a, a, an antipathy for that. Socialism, now that they find they have to put it under a different title. So as you mentioned, this, uh, you know, s stakeholder capitalism, right, right. as opposed to shareholder, shareholder capitalism. capitalism. They want a different form of capitalism. Yep. And they say this is an old form of capitalism such as predominated before the stakeholder, the shareholder right. capitalism of Milton Friedman. Uh, but you read what they write about it, and you realize, as one incisive gentleman pointed out, that they don't talk about ownership of anything. It's like a common, things are, are basically held in common. And talk about actually owning anything. It's all very communal. It's all communal. That's socialism. I mean, and you look at the motto, Klaus Schwab, uh, the, the man who founded this and is now like director of this World Economic Forum, right, has written several books on, on this subject about where we have to go with the economy of the world. Notice we're talking about a global economy yeah. now. Okay. Allah, okay, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, and so on. John, uh, Francis, certainly, all the way, right? Calling for a world economic authority with power of enforcement, a police 
hours of enforcement to get nations to comply. They've been calling for this since, well, early Vatican II. Yeah. So um, this is this is the these are the modernists in the Vatican right now, okay? Leftists again. But you know the uh, the World Economic Forum has on its website the, the model: you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. And this is what they're driving towards. So uh, there actually was a, a brief video showing a young man, and this is attributed to him, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Okay. That was taken down, oddly enough, when more attention was recently brought to it. Why? Because I think it exposed the reality <clears throat> behind the jargon. Okay? Uh, they're, they're trying to market this stakeholder socialism, which means simply communal ownership, basically. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this kind of goes along also with Bernie Sanders. He's talking about a, a different form of socialism. Now we're going to have democratic socialism. And you ask, okay, democratic socialism and stakeholder capitalism, what's the difference between these two things? You know, Someone uh, pointed out that, well, in democratic socialism, the government would not actually take ownership of these things. They would still remain in private hands. <clears throat> Uh, whether it be private corporations or whatever, but the government would tax them, would tax them in such a way that they would effectively, you know, be socialist. It would be a socialist society because the government would just basically demand so much money from them every year uh, to distribute. The government would distribute to people at large. <clears throat> and, um, you know, to... The old saying is, uh, the power to tax is the power to destroy. That's uh, so true. That's why our founding fathers and, and ran through the history of our country would not allow uh, the civil government to tax churches <clears throat> because they didn't want the civil government to have that control over religion, over faith, churches. But uh, you can be sure in this stakeholder capitalism and this democratic socialism, which is essentially going to come down to pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> You're going to have taxation of everybody and everyone, uh, everywhere for everything, basically. <clears throat> There's also information on the World Economic Forum website about this kind of oh, statement of some bad young fellow who's talking about describing, describing the village or the city he lives in in the year 2030. By the way, they say that You'll own nothing and you'll be happy is the way it's going to be. In two, by 2030, that's the way it's going to be. You'll own nothing and you will be happy. Because whatever was formerly a product is now just going to be given to you as a service. You won't be able to, to buy it as a product and use it as yours. You'll just be able to use it as a service that is provided for you. Again, socialism. You know, the basic fundamentals of living in a socialist world here. No rights, only only privileges. Right, basically, basically. And you have to toe the line. But it comes down to pretty much, if you want to see what it's going to be like, it's going to be like what China is right now. Right? Everybody has a cell phone because that's their internal passport. Yeah. All of their information is given there. The police have the key, right, to get into the passport, the cell phones. And they can stop you and check with you and see where you're going, what you're doing there. Whether, whether how you rate on the social scale, they even give you the, like this social, almost like report card, social credit. and and that will determine whether or not you can travel, where you can go, who you can associate with, right, where you can shop, even depending on how well you do on the social scale, meaning, are you in the good graces of the party or not? So essentially, we're looking at uh, turning an America into communist China. Uh, turning the entire world into communist China. Well, are those, are those Chinese people happy, Father? Uh, well, I'm sure if you were to ask them on the street, they would, they would tell you they are fabulously happy. But if you talk to them um, when they, they're not being monitored, yeah. I mean, the, the very fact is surveillance is everywhere. They're being constantly watched all the time. Right? So, I mean, let's face it, if you have your cell phone with you all the time and you have the idea, okay, this is a two-way, this is like a walkie-talkie, yep. <clears throat> I have to be careful that of what I say because I, I might have the police at my door tonight because of what I said this morning. <clears throat> and I think that's what you find. You know, you read about the 
the concentration camps they've got there right now for some of the you know, one branch of the Muslim people. Uh, they've got a million, a million people interned in, in one of those right now, supposedly. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it is truly a democratic socialist society over there. And uh, I'm sure if we looked a little further, it would fit Francis's requirement. Uh, because Francis talks about all this stuff. He used this as different terminology, of course. But he, he's talking in the same vein. I mean, oh, yeah. this World Economic Forum message, uh, the Great Reset, that's, that's Francis. This is Francis. Uh, he's on, totally on board with this. And um, no wonder that Sarando, the Archbishop, who's in charge now under Francis of like the Catholic social uh, gospel and so on, says that China is the best example of Catholic social, uh, uh, civil theology uh, the, uh, in terms of the um, social doctrine of the church. Yeah. China has best implemented the social doctrine of the church. He's referring to the Novus Ordo. And uh, Francis seems to think that's wonderful. It certainly done, hasn't corrected that, hasn't changed that, hasn't objected to it. So this is their idea of the ideal. That's the idea of the ideal society. Don't be surprised. Look at who Francis has over at the Vatican for all of these conferences, right? They're all the population control people. They're all in this up to their ears. Yep. And we see the, the corporations here, <clears throat> many of them well known to us, who are all involved, all in for this great reset of what, what uh, uh, Schwab, Klaus Schwab calls the fourth industrial revolution. And he even has a list of the Center, center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution founding fathers. <clears throat> and they include Facebook, Microsoft, Qualcomm, American Heart Association, Visa, the Vaccine Alliance, of course, um, and quite a number of others, too. They're all in. Are all in. Yeah, Father. One one uh, one thing that I I thought was um, kind of kind of telling was uh, on this World Economic Forum on on their website with some of their information, they talk a lot about the uh, the COVID nineteen crisis and use that as kind of the the launch point mm. for this whole thing. And um, I I thought it was kind of telling just to read through this one uh, little paragraph here. It says that. Uh, talking about the, the poor state of the, the world economy and says unemployment is skyrocketing in many countries. In the U.S., for example, one in four workers have filed for unemployment since mid-March with new weekly claims far above historic highs. The International Monetary Fund expects the world economy to shrink by 3% this year, a downgrade of 6.3 percentage point in just four months. All of this will exacerbate the climate and social crises that, we, that were already underway. Some countries have already used the COVID-19 crisis as an excuse to weaken environmental protections and enforcement and frustrations over social ills like rising inequality. U.S. billionaires' combined wealth has increased during the crisis. Um, <clears throat> frustrations like this are intensifying. But I thought, Father, this, this one statement here, you know, saying how all of this, the whole entire world needs to be reset. Every, um, every institution, every financial, monetary inst institution, every, uh, every our entire health, education, every system in the whole entire world needs to be reset because since mid-March, um, you know, the, the world economy has, has, has kind of take, taken a downturn. We all know, Father, what, what happened in, in mid-March was when our, our governments effectively shut down our economies. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, you know, the, it's kind of like they, they have this contrived crisis that, that they exactly. created themselves, and now they're mm. pointing to this as, as proof And this positive. is why we need the Great Reset. Yeah. How, how mm. dishonest is that, Father? And is that mm. not just typical leftist? Um, it is. It you know, is. They, they, they have the saying, don't, don't, let the, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Well, well you know, Tom, this is diabolical wisdom here. This is, this is the devil's wisdom. Look what happened at Vatican II, right? Like, it caused a crisis. Yeah. And the only solution for the crisis that the modernists caused at Vatican II was more modernism. Yeah. It's as though you had a patient <clears throat> and you gave the patient poison. And the patient became ill. And the prescription was, well, the problem with the patient is that the, the patient needs more poison. So let's double the dosage. Give them twice as much modernism. Yep. 
right? Then 10 times as much monitors. And you look at the chart at the end of the bed, and the, the patient's condition is declining and declining and declining. <clears throat> and there are those voices raising, well, look, you're killing the patient. Oh, no, no, don't be silly. You know, the patient just needs more and more monitorism. That's the key to everything. That's what the bishops did. That's what the Nova Soto bishops did. So eventually we began to figure out that, you know, they're trying to kill this patient. They want to kill this patient because they want to bring in an imposter. They want, they want to uh, actually replace this patient as Pope Pius X had warned, right, about modernism, and as Pope Pius IX before him had warned uh, that the, the Freemasons were going to uh, infiltrate the church and try to come up, basically hijack the church and, 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 and insert an imposter in its place, a worldly, a worldly imposter, religion of the world. <clears throat> That's what we now know as the Nova Soto, the New Order. Um, but their solution was always the same. <laughs> create a problem and then fix it. The devil always does that. He always finds a way to create a problem and then he always is waiting there to sell you the solution, right? His solution to the problem that he created. Yeah, that's what we see here. Exactly what we see going on here. And what's the Catholic response to that, Father? How can we how can we guard against that? I mean, obviously, as Catholics, we know there are there, the world certainly has its problems. I mean, we of course would not deny that there are definitely problems with with mm -hmm. educational system with with every system out there. But mm -hmm. we don't want to entirely tear all of these down to, to shreds and start over, do we? Well, no, of course not. <clears throat> of course not. That, that's that's not the way you save the patient by killing him. And saying, let's, let's kill the patient, bury him, let's start over again. Yeah. Uh, this is what they say they want to do. I mean, look at, look at the situation with the perversions today, okay? We see the timeline of where they started, okay? They start out with the 18th century and 19th century idea, especially the 19th century idea of free love, mm. okay? Free love. All that means is promiscuity yeah. with no responsibility, okay? Well, the problem with that is, see, there's a problem with that, right? What problem comes from that? Promiscuity. All kinds well, of problems. Well, well, disease and yeah. babies. Yeah, yeah. You know, babies yeah. can come, right? So, you see, now we've got a problem. We have a problem that babies are being born, and they're being born out of wedlock, and nobody's really taking responsibility for them. <clears throat> if the mother is trying to, she really can't, right? Because she's still a child herself often. So, gee, what do we do? What do we do? Well, you see, the solution to that then is birth control. So, oh, you know, problem solved, birth control. Now you can have promiscuity without babies. Now, isn't that wonderful, see? But the problem does continue, though, because there are social problems that come from that. There's so much promiscuity. We have family breakups, and we still are having babies because... There are people who aren't using this birth control as we want everybody to be on birth control, right? And there's still babies. So what do we do? Well, abortion. Now, abortion, we can solve the problem with abortion, see? Now, even if you have a baby and you don't want a baby, now you can get rid of the baby. There you have a perfect solution, okay? But the problem that arises from abortion now, people are beginning to lose the sense of the value of human life, see? So it starts getting to the point where, well, let's kill off the old people and the sick, and a little euthanasia here and there, you know, no harm in that, right? And uh, so it goes on and on. The, the, the devil is constantly proposing the solution, <clears throat> which makes things worse than ever. And then he's always there for another solution to make it worse than it was. Always, always. And, you know, very few of these uh, people who are even pro-life will take it back to this. You should not be having sexual relations outside of marriage unless you're ready to be a husband and a wife and a mom and a dad. You shouldn't be doing it. It's shameful. It's sinful. <clears throat> People are afraid to say that now. That's a hard saying. Because it, it really goes against, what, how, how dare you? How dare you tell me that, right? Who are you to tell me that I can't have, you know, this and that? Tell me I can't be doing this and that. <clears throat> but it comes down to it. But that's where the devil started this whole vicious cycle, you know, of... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, problem. I, I want to, you know, I want to do what I'm doing here. I want more free love, and there are too many restrictions. Okay, dearie, I'll give that to you. See? Oh, wait a minute. Now we're having all these babies. What do you do about that? So they have to constantly be looking for another diabolical solution, and we're in this downward, downward spiral, 
right now, like that time. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it comes down to the fact that we have to entirely step out of that spiral <clears throat> and re recognize it for what it is and where it started. And it, it started with a rebellion against God's will. Look, all of the people who are involved in this are talking about saving the world, right? Saving the world from all the stuff you were reading about there. And, uh, and the reason why they're in that position is because they reject the true God. They actually start by rejecting the world as God made it. Now, this isn't really the world as God made it. This is the world as we made it by sin. Okay, so let's get that straight. God didn't create the sinful world. He created a world without sin and a world in grace in Adam and Eve. Okay, we have then wrecked this. God has graciously given us a Savior, His own Son, to come and pay the price of our sin to restore souls to grace again. But it is still nonetheless a fallen world, as you know. And so these people, basically, who are behind all of this, reject the, the world as it is. Okay, And they reject the God that made the world. They reject the God who created the world. They will not accept him. If they believe in him, they consider him the enemy, really. I mean, this is how the Gnostics thought. This is ancient Gnosticism, reborn in a like technological paradise for them. This is high-tech Gnosticism, as all it says. <clears throat> Reject the world as it is, the reality of the world as it is. <clears throat> Renounce the God who made it. Now, who's left? Us. We are the ones. We have to step up in place. We have to climb Mount Olympus, and we, the billionaires, we have to be the ones who are going to be the gods of the modern age. And we're the ones who are going to have to redesign the world according to our vision. And that's what they're, all, that's what they're trying to do. Soros and Gates and the rest of them, um, they are basically crowning themselves, uh, deifying themselves. Even Soros came out and said it. George Soros came out and said, this makes me feel like God. He said that publicly. He's on a record saying that. <clears throat> and this is um, a very serious warning that we're dealing with an ancient um, cult of Gnostics here who have just decided, okay, this evil world, uh, if there is a God behind it, he's bad, and so, or he's lost control, whatever it is, so we have to step forward and we have to become the gods of the modern age. And with our money, we have to make, we have to transform the world. Hey, Schumer says we will transform the United States of America. Biden just says we'll transform the United States of America, right? He's going to transform it all, right? <clears throat> well, these are the people who are all in favor of transgenderism. If that's their idea of transformation, heaven only knows what they're going to do to what they want to do to America and the rest of the world, for that matter, if that's their idea of transformation. <clears throat> but in any case, um, this, is their, this is their mindset. You know? No one asked me, <clears throat> certainly George Soros hasn't called me and Bill Gates hasn't called me to ask me, if I want, if I want them to transform the world for me, right? If I want to be living in a world that they have created, do I want them to recreate the world for me and transform the world for me? I would say, no, thanks, but no thanks. You know? But we don't get anything to say about that. Why? <clears throat> because we will either, we'll be their creatures who will be transformed to have a place in their world or we'll be in a gulag somewhere or dead because we don't fit. Okay? We'll be vaccinated out of existence, you know, if we don't fit into the world that they intend to create. And uh, uh, something tells me right now that both you and I would be a bad fit, right? For that. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think they'll figure that out too. Um, but these people are, you know what they are? They're plutocrats. They're plutocrats. And it's kind of an interesting uh, term. I'm sorry, going off on a tangent here. <clears throat> but, you know, they talk about Democrats and they talk about uh, <clears throat> idiocrats. <laughs> right? And we have uh, plutocrats. Uh, the, the word comes from plotos in Greek, meaning, well, it actually means uh, uh, 
basically buried in the earth. And the things that are buried in the earth are gems, diamonds. <clears throat> and so it came to mean people are very wealthy. So plutocracy is, is a society that is governed by the, the extremely wealthy. The wealthiest people govern that society. <clears throat> but remember, Pluto was a god of the underworld, right? Makes sense. I mean, if, if the riches are found in the earth and under the earth, well, who's going to be the god of the underworld but Pluto, right? And he's taking people across the river Styx, right, with the three-headed dogs nipping at their heels. He's taking them into the land of darkness, right? <clears throat> in the land of misery and shadows, right? So here we have the plutocrats, very, very wealthy, taking us all into a very, very dark shadow world, basically across the river Styx. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there are many who want to go with them, many who want to have been in leader posi leadership positions now, so hopefully they will be the overlords of the world to come, of, uh, <clears throat> you know, Soros land and... Uh, Gatesville or whatever. <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, I think they're in for a shock when they find out that uh, they are no longer needed. But in any case, uh, Tom, there's no place, you know, remember what, what, what Klaus Schwab said, <clears throat> that in the Great Reset, you'll have the fusion of our physical identities of our uh, digital identity and of our biological identity. But he didn't put it quite that way. He said our physical and digital and biological identities, as though we have multiple identities, a physical identity, a biological identity, and a digital identity. Well, you see, <clears throat> these things are, are not united yet. And so the Great Reset has to take these identities of each one of us and fuse them together. Now, you know, I ask you, well, first of all, there's nothing about a soul or anything spiritual in any of us, in the, in the, according to the scheme of things. But did you ever think of yourself as having a, a digital identity, a separate <laughs> digital identity? Well, congratulations. They just gave you one. And they're going, to, they're going to fuse that together with your physical and your biological identity. Wow. Sounds like a multi-person uh, dis disorder. <laughs> it, it really does sound like multi-personality yeah. disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm afraid uh, it is. <laughs> it's a real disorder there. <clears throat> so anybody with an ounce of sense... Certainly those with faith should look at this and realize this is not from heaven. This is from hell. And, uh, you know, some people are saying, well, Jimmy, there's, there's so much force behind this right now. I mean, I, let a, I read a list of the corporations that are multi-billion dollar corporations. And so they're not only the wealthiest people in the world are behind this, but people who have great power in many other aspects, political power and military power, too. Behind this, they think, is there any way we can, we can avoid this now? Is there any way we can stop this now? Um, I mean, even if things happen on December 4th and the electors name uh, probably the one man who is the most, the biggest obstacle to their goal, right? Donald Trump is not on board with this, evidently, right? And they, they've trained like Sauron's eye. They've, Sauron, they've trained all of their attention at him. <laughs> It made it sound like it's all about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But I don't even know if Donald Trump even has realized necessarily the gravity of all this. He probably does by now. <clears throat> um, but why there's such personal enmity directed toward him? Because he's in their way. And, uh, and he's kind of raised people's, uh, got, got people resisting them now, standing up to them, saying, no, I will not go into that dark winter of Joe Biden. Um, so they, they just have to, at any cost, uh, get rid of him. But some people are thinking, well, even if, even if uh, you know, the Electoral College of the United States does declare Trump to be the president, 
Uh, what happens then, as you say, the consequences of that, the reaction to that will be so violent and vehement and vicious. Uh, is there any way possible to hold back this? And the answer is yes, it is. There were many times in the world's history when things, oh, it looked like all was lost. Um, even for the church during the great Western schism, certainly for society during the 14th century when it, it was hard to find anything that went right in the 14th century. It, it was incredible how awful it was. And people really thought that, that this, they were living in the end times. And maybe they would have been, but for the fact that they did what they were supposed to do. They prayed and they stopped sinning and they were, enough, at least enough of them, uh, saints cooperated with the grace of God to become saints and to lead the way. It's what we need now. I believe we can turn all this back around. I believe we can turn all this back uh, if we will just now do what God is giving us the grace to do. Why do I believe that? Well, I, I, I believe that God is showing us something and giving us another opportunity, that we are here in a situation now where the snake's head is exposed, where it is being recognized more and more, and uh, where there are people responding to that. And I don't believe that God would give us this, this vision and this opportunity unless he were also willing to give us the victory, too. So I, I believe that we, we, we can, by uh, the grace of God, turn this back, but only by the grace of God. So we have to do what our lady said, stop offending God by sin, live in the state of grace, <clears throat> and uh, pray, right, especially the rosary. Make reparation to God by little sacrifices, the little sacrifices of every day. What did, what did Lucia say was required when she talked about sacrifice? She said, be faithful to the duties of your state in life, which is incumbent upon every one of us. Just be faithful to the duties of your state in life. That's the great sacrifice God is asking of us. I mean, if we would all do this, you as a husband and father and me as a priest, and, as, and so many, many others who have faith in God and trust in him and hopefully hope and love him too, um, if they would do this, they would be answering Our Lady's request in Fatima. It's not rocket science. It's, it's not, uh, you know, swim the ocean or climb, you know, uh, the, uh, the highest mountain or anything like that. It's doing what is right, ready at hand there. And the grace of God is ready at hand. But also a devotion to our Immaculate Heart, to devote ourselves to our Immaculate Heart, to learn from her. As our Lord said, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Well, he's given Our Lady's heart as a very good lesson too. As she says, you know, uh, I am meek. Our Lady said, Precisely, her lowliness was what was what uh, won such graces for her and privileges for her. Her lowliness, her humility. So, if our Lord would say, "Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart," you know, He would certainly say that. Learn from her too. Okay, uh, He created her as His masterpiece of creation, and uh, when we honor her, we honor Him. So. Um, so anyway, we, sh we should dedicate ourselves to our Immaculate Heart and try to imitate the virtues of being the servant, always the servant and the handmaid of God and His, his, his holy will. So anyway, you ask, <clears throat> you ask, uh, you know, where, where we go from here, and I think that's where we all have to go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and Father, that's definitely something that... And that give I'm, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that time of year. <clears throat> you know, we have Thanksgiving here upon us, yeah. and uh, it's something we should do every day. Right? At every Mass, we have the preface, right? And we talk about it is incumbent upon us to give thanks to God, to be thankful to Him. Such that, I mean, that is so pronounced as sort of like, well, it's, what is the preface of the Mass? The preface is the introduction to the canon of the Mass. It's the preface of the Mass, the canon of the Mass. And it starts with the idea of giving thanks to God. Well, that's where the term Eucharist came from, Eucharistia comes from that, thanksgiving. It should be a Catholic way of life, to be always giving thanks to God. And if we can be truly thankful, how many times does St. Paul say that? How many times do we read that in sacred scripture about the need to be, to be thankful, the need to be grateful, grateful to God? And if we can be grateful to God, we can appreciate the blessings that he's given to us. We can actually enjoy them. Nobody enjoys his blessings less than the ingrate. The one who's ungrateful 
may have all the blessings the world can give. He can't enjoy them. He can't enjoy them. They just make him sad or mad. <laughs> you know, he can go mad. With it. He can't enjoy them, though. Nothing satisfies him. But the grateful heart is, uh, enjoys everything, is grateful for everything. And this is what opens the heart to receive more and more blessings from God. It's in gratitude that not only poisons our enjoyment of the blessings we do have, but closes our hearts against any further blessings. We, we lose the blessings of God that we already have because of our ingratitude. But when we are grateful, genuinely, uh, heartily grateful to God for his blessings, and uh, then we not only can be assured that those blessings will persist, but that God will increase them because we can be entrusted with them. It's like he's investing these blessings in us. And we return his investment with, with thanks. <clears throat> um, so we need to truly uh, appreciate the blessings we have, realize that if we're frightened now because we have so much to lose, it is precisely because we have so much that we have so much to lose. And we ought to be grateful for what we have so much from God. So we should make this um, Thanksgiving period <clears throat> a, a special reminder of the need for gratitude. But we should carry that throughout the year, every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think, Father, just, just something practical that people could do would something simple would just be, be to, to even just to pray grace after meals. I know um, mm. that, that they're even just... Well, even uh, before for some people. Well, yeah, <laughs> but you're right. Yeah. But, you know, I, I Afterwards, think, too. I think, um, I, you know, I just wonder how many even Catholic families will, will have a big Thanksgiving meal, obviously pray grace before meals, but then not pray grace after mm -hmm. meals. And, you know, I think that that, that would do... Uh, a lot, you know, <clears throat> even just, just in, in the short few seconds that it, that it takes to say that, if you were to pray that mm -hmm. three times every, every single day, you know, after, after each and every meal, um, you know, it says... In, well, in that's the assume the families are eating together, yeah. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Big assumption these days. Yeah. But, you know, when everybody sits down at the table and they're all ready to, to dig in and they pray grace, they're all there and it's sort of like the countdown, you know? <laughs> um, but as the meal progresses and people get filled and so on, the kids get a little uh, edgy at the table and they leave. And then so-and-so starts leaving and taking the plates off and doing the dishes. And people drift off little by little. And pretty soon there's only grandpa left with uh, maybe, who knows. <clears throat> uh, and th that's all that's left. They've all kind of filtered off. Yep. So praying grace after meals, you're absolutely right, Tom. That's very, very important. And yet it's, it's hard for families to keep everybody at the table to do that. If they applied themselves to it, if they understood the need for it, though, they could make mm -hmm. it happen. Because it even says in the prayer, Father, you know, we're not only thanking God for, for the, the food that we have here, but we say we give you thanks for, for these and all of thy blessings. So, you know, it doesn't only pertain just, just to the, the food we have there in front of us, but um, just, you know, to everything, to right. all of God's all blessings. All of God's so. blessings. You're yeah. absolutely right, Tom. Yeah. So, definitely. I wonder how many of our... Uh, even our Catholic people even remember the prayer, uh, the, you know, the formula for grace after meals. But they'll find it in their missiles, so, in their prayer books. Yeah. Cool. So. Well, Father, thanks for being here tonight. We got through a lot, and I think it was uh, very productive. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we thank our viewers, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.